everyone. Hello. Welcome to Head Talks. We have, you're welcome. We haven't been together uh, for a couple of weeks. You're right. And we're in the middle of a, uh, we're in the middle of a series, so I'm going to have to do a good review today. <coughs> what we're doing, what the series is all about is, do you remember? It's been so long. It's about the King and Queens of England. Yes, we're doing Kings and Queens of England. Mm. But what I decided I wanted to name this particular session was Aquitaine. I want to call it Aquitaine. And the reason why I want to do that is because we have fantastical stories about the lives of these people, but the backdrop, the thing that propels all of these incredible stories is what? The land. The land. The land. The land. It's the land. Everything is about the land. And in this particular story, or in this particular time frame, it is the land of Aquitaine that propels the drama, the betrayal, the dysfunction of the story that I have for you today. All right, so we're going to go back to uh, what we were talking about before Christmas. I'm sure you all remember. Oh, sure. Yeah, you remember everything that we discussed two weeks ago before we celebrated uh, Christmas and New Year's? Yeah. Well, we talked about Henry I. Remember Henry I was the last born child of William the Conqueror, correct? Yeah. All right, and then through a lot of... A, just a lot of twists and turns. The youngest messy. son, what, Effie? It was messy. It was very messy, yes. They're all, these stories are very messy. Um, the youngest son, the least likely to inherit the throne, does what? He inherits, he inherits the throne. The last man standing. The last man standing, yeah. The, in the Game of Thrones, he was the last man standing. All right, so he has done what now? Because not only is he the King of England, but he's also the Duke of? Normandy. Normandy, exactly. So what does he have to try to do now? Bring peace. He's got to bring peace to these two lands, right? And so he does that, and, in, and he does it in certain ways. Do you remember um, this? Do you remember the Exchequer? Yeah. We talked about that. Yes, yes, we want yes, we want a fair system throughout um, the lands that he now oversees, that he rules, and so he develops this system called the exchequer. And from that system, when you're paying taxes, it's going to be um, equal, right? Yeah. yeah, everybody. He's trying to make everything everything equitable. And through that system, do you know? Do you recall that we still have? a remnant of that system with us to this very day. Yes, excellent. Yes, uh, checks. We write checks. We have checks because of Henry the First, king of... I know, who wants bills like this? You know what? When I, when, I, when I put that up there, I thought someone was going to catch on to that. It took a couple of weeks, but thank you for catching up, catching on to that. Okay, and then he did something else that was extraordinary and it was completely out of the blue. And what that was, was he hired, he appointed what was called new men. And the new men were appointed to positions based on what? Skills. Skills. And it was up until this time based on nobility, right? Yes. It all depended on who your father was. All right, so you're in high positions with a lot of responsibility, um, not because you know what you're doing, but because... You have yeah. Exactly, exactly, because you're high-born, born, just because you are high-born. But Henry was too practical. He was too pragmatic for that kind of a thing, and so he brought on what, he, what is called new, the new men, and what did this establish? Do you remember? I know it was two weeks ago. There's another layer of society. There's another level, and this is the level of professionals. 
All right, so you've got another tier in the um, hierarchy system, and it's the level of professionals with the new, with the new men. Now, the other thing that Henry has to do in order to um, maintain his grip on the throne is what? Produce. Yes, he has to produce an heir, and so he does that, and he has his son, William. He also has a daughter, Matilda, and you might, re you might recall that he had a few illegitimate children as well. Does anybody remember how many? Yes, Bob. <laughs> 22 illegitimate children. But we do want to say, we do want to say and acknowledge. He provided for them. He did, yes, Effie. He provided for them. He was a good father. He was a good father. He provided for them. He acknowledged them. They all knew one another and had relationships with one another. All right, so even, even William and Matilda knew who their half-siblings were, and they had a relationship, they had a relationship. So now Henry is all set, he's taking care of everything, the um, two lands are in very good shape, and he's got his heir, so he's all set until something happened, do you remember? Remember the white ship disaster? The white ship disaster was William, and actually some of his half-siblings, uh, they got onto this ship, they got onto the ship, and the ship crashed. Everybody on the ship died. Everyone died. So William, the only legitimate son, was not able um, obviously to become king because he died in this disaster. He died in this disaster. So Henry now, who is older, Henry's older. And what is he going to do? Is, is it possible to have an illegitimate son take the throne? No, they didn't, want, they didn't like that. It would be really difficult. It would be very hard um, to do that. But he has a daughter, right? Yep. Remember, he's got Matilda, yeah. and Matilda married pretty well, didn't she? Yeah, yeah she married the Holy Roman Empire uh, yeah. Emperor. Yeah. So she is now, what is she? Empress. empress. Yes, she's an empress. Yeah. All right, so now if um, she has a son, is that going to fix everything? Everything will be put, set right again? No, no. it wasn't. Well, that, but that was what Henry was thinking, right? All I need is a grandson, uh -huh. all right? And then I can keep my dynasty. I can keep my dreams of a dynasty alive, all right? So my son is dead, but my daughter, if she has a son, I can keep it. And then my daughter can be regent until he comes of age, right? Wasn't that the plan? Yep. Uh -huh. That was the plan. But remember what happened to... Um, the, her husband. He died. He died. He died. He died. He died. So, ah! And they had not had a child together. So now Henry's got to do something. He's got to act very quickly and uh, get her married again. And so this time he arranges a marriage for her. Um, the newly widowed woman is now going to marry. Jeffrey, the fair. the fair, remember? And and what is he? What is his title? Do you recall? The Duke of something. Well, very close, very close. He is he is the Count of Anjou, and he is called Jeffrey Plantagenet. All right. So this is the very first Plantagenet the very first Plantagenet. So this whole dynasty, this whole 300 year dynasty is named after Geoffrey Plantagenet, but it might astonish you to know that Plantagenet is not the family name. Plantagenet is a nickname and they're so called because Geoffrey often wore this flower called a Plantagenet, that's the English translation, in his hat. 
and it often appear, it would appear on the family crest. So the name Plantagenet is not a family name, it's a nickname, and now they've come down through history as Plantagenets after a flower, after a yellow flower. He was Geoffrey of Anjou. All right, now, um, this marriage, and of course he was, I guess, a really good-looking guy. He's Geoffrey the Fair, a good-looking guy. Uh, doesn't appear that Matilda was too unhappy with this arranged marriage. Uh, pretty soon, they do. Geoffrey and Matilda have a son, and who is this son? Henry. Yes, exactly, Bob. Henry, Henry the second. Now he's just a baby, he's just a toddler, all right? And Henry the first is getting nervous because he knows that his time is coming to an end. And he is calling his noblemen together and asking them to pledge fealty to Matilda as regent until his grandson is of age, and they agree to do that. They agree. So in 1135, Henry I dies, and so it would seem like a pretty straightforward thing now, right? What's supposed to happen? Messy. Matilda is supposed to be regent for her son. No, it's not going to work out. It's not going to work out that way because remember the, the um, white ship disaster? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, now on that day, on that day when everybody boarded the, uh, the ship, there was somebody that wasn't there that was supposed to be. Uh -huh. Supposed to be. And that somebody that decided at the last minute not to get on the ship was Stephen. Stephen and Stephen was William Simon. Was was the, was the son of William's daughter. All right, Stephen is, so here, so Adela is the daughter of William the Conqueror. All right, she's like two years older than Henry. Mm -hmm. All right, and she has a son. Her son is Stephen. Her son is Stephen. So Stephen, who didn't get on the ship, ch changed his, the fate, his fate, now that Henry I has died, he has decided that he has a claim to the throne. Uh -huh. He should be king of England, all right? And so he gets himself to England. Remember, they're all French, right? Yeah. yeah. They're all French. Um, they don't speak English. They speak French. They're all French. He gets himself to England and he is going to claim the throne, all right? And he does. He gets crowned. And why is that? Do you remember? I went off on a whole thing about this two weeks ago, but perhaps you don't remember. Because they didn't want a woman. Excellent, Edith. Exactly. Because the only reason, the only reason, remember Matilda is the daughter of the king. But the nephew of the king was able to usurp the throne for one reason and one reason only. He's a man. He's a man. And then I showed a clip last time. How are women treated in the 12th century? Not just in the 12th century, it goes on for a long time. We're still second class. Subservient. They are, they are property, right? Yeah. They're property. Does it matter what uh, station in life you have? No. Do you have a say, no matter, even if you're royal, do you have a say in who you marry? No. 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 Women were pawns. Even high-born women, or especially high-born women, because they're bargaining chips, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yes. For Elizabeth I. <clears throat> We have a long, long, long way to go before we get there. <laughs> but they're used, but they're used, correct? Yes. They're used for alliances, right? They're used for um, alliances. They have no say. So when I put up a photograph like this, 
depicting, this isn't actually Matilda and Henry, of course. Um, but when I put up a picture like this, and I'm showing you a young woman with her child, this is probably quite accurate. This is probably an appropriate, correct depiction of Matilda. But when some force comes up against her child, she also looks like this. Yeah. Yeah. Matilda is a very strong, determined woman, and she is not going to stand for this. She's not going to take it. She's not going to allow Stephen, who is her cousin, to come in and usurp her son's birthright, take her son's birthright away from him. And so this enters into the time called the anarchy, if you recall that from last time. And, we, and this, this lasted for almost 20 years. There was a battle between Matilda and Geoffrey and Stephen's forces for the crown. They go into um, great battles together. Matilda herself suits up and goes into battle. This is really, this is a very, very powerful woman. All right? Uh, but it goes on for so long because Stephen has the backing of who? And is that important? Is that critical? Yeah. It's abs yes, in those days, it's absolutely essential that you have the backing of the Pope. So what Matilda is doing, so she is a warrior, a politician, but she's also a mother. And at first, in his first years, she has her son in Anjou. And he's being raised there until he's about nine years old because she realizes it's going to strengthen his claim if he lives in England, right? Where does everybody else live, by the way? France. France. All right. It's going to strengthen his claim if he lives in England. And so when he's nine years old, she sends him to Brittany. I've put this up um, because I really wanted to say that over the 19 years that these battles go on, there's, this is an over, overly simplified explanation, but there's lands that are taken and lost, taken and lost. The mm -hmm. battles just go back and forth and back and forth. Um, but Henry is sent to live in Bristol in England. Stephen's forces are here, right? Mm. And does that put little Henry in danger? Yes. It really, it really does. But she felt, she felt that it was important enough that she had to have him have lived in England to strengthen um, his claim to the throne. Um, not only have they educated young Henry academically, do you remember how uh, kings in waiting were educated. Do you remember we went over that? Yeah. Militarily. Mi militarily, yes. Um, and then if you were not expected to become the king, then you were educated academically because you were expected to uh, become, go into what? The priesthood. Excellent, yes, into the priesthood. Uh, but Matilda and Geoffrey did not handle their son that way. They, they um, educated him academically and militarily. And when he was 15 years old, his father put him in charge of battles in, uh, not in England, but in smaller battles in France, in the south of France. And he did very, very well. So when he is a little bit older, when he's 17, 18 years old, what does he do? Do you remember? He goes, he, he forms an army, and he is now, after 19 years, going to take over for his mother. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. She fought for 19 years, and now he is old enough where he's going to come in, and he's going to um, take over for her, and then she goes back. Uh, she goes back to France. So he does, and... You know, all the details are, are in the other session that we had. But ultimately what happens is Stephen signs a treaty with Henry 
stating that Stephen will remain king until the time of his death, and upon his death, who will be his heir? Henry. 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 But the suspicion is, the rumor is, he never intended to keep that. Right? He never intended to keep that. Because he, his son, he has a son, William. He had a, an older son, Eustace, who had passed away. But he also had William. And um, the rumor was that um, William had arranged for the assassination of Henry. So it seemed like this treaty was signed. Yes. With, to waste time, yes, to buy time. And it was signed nefariously, all right? There was a plot against Henry. But what happened, very unexpectedly, he died. Stephen died. Stephen died unexpectedly yeah, yeah. shortly after, all right? And what does Henry have? Kingdom. The signed right. document, right? Yeah. All right, he's got the signed document. The assassination attempt didn't happen uh, before Stephen died. And so now Henry enters into England. And what do we have? <laughs> the very first, the very first Plantagenet king. However, I really, really was excited to point out to you, that's not how he's called. That is not how he's called. Do you know how he's called? No, I forgot. He is called Henry Fitz Empress. Oh my God. Henry Fitz Empress, which is highly unusual, but how is it that he has a claim to the throne? Mother. Through, his mother. Through his mother. So he is Henry Fitz Empress, Henry son of the Empress, and that is how he is called. So today, we're going to look at his reign. We're going to look at the things that he has done. All right? Now, I have to say, do you think Matilda is an unusually strong woman? Yep. Yeah. yeah, of course she was. Yeah. Yes. Well, do you know that, well, what do you think? Do you think that it would be remarkable for a person to have such a, a woman in their life? That would be highly unusual and astonishing and remarkable, correct? Inspirational. Yeah. Inspirational, yes. I'm sure he was inspired by his mother. But this man, this man, Henry Fitz Empress, he lucked out not just once by getting Matilda as his mother, he lucked out twice. All right? He lucked out twice because he had more than one strong woman in his life. And who is the other strong woman that he has? Eleanor of Aquitaine. Excellent. Eleanor of Aquitaine. Exactly. So now, before he becomes king, um, he becomes the husband of Eleanor. And let's take a look at her because she is something in her own right. She is said to be beautiful. She is a legendary beauty. But do you know the only thing we have to go by is her effigy. This is it. Wow. There are no paintings, there are no descriptions, we don't have anything in writing about what she looked like. Uh, we have writings about her, but no descriptions of her. We do have that for Henry. But what do we know about her? Well, we do know, um, aside from the fact that she was a legendary beauty, um, that she is... She's very bright. Well, she well she was very bright. She was. She wrote poetry. Yes, um, but what I want to say is that her father adored her and educated her as you would a son. Uh, yeah. All right. So she. That's, unusual that's very unusual. Yeah. So her father. So her father is the Duke of Aquitaine, and he is. She is the apple of his eye. All right, this is, he doesn't have a son, she's the eldest, and she is the apple of his eye. He ed educates her um, in the way that you would educate 
a son. And in addition to that, he allows her to be present when he is meeting with other noblemen. Mm -hmm. He allows her in the room. She's at the table by his side. She's hearing these men and these conversations that are going on. She's hearing the philosophies of the day. She's hearing the po politics of the day. She is right at her father's side. So she is exquisitely educated. She's also um, bilingual, at least. It says she speaks, I know she speaks French and Latin, um, but she speaks other languages, and I couldn't find out what those other languages were. All right, but when her father um, gets ill, he wants to protect her because if you're the Duke of Aquitaine, um, that's a big piece of land, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I have a map and I'll show it to you. So he wants to protect her because that's going to put her in danger, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Remember, does, does a woman inherit? No. Not until... She, It'll be hers, but only until what? She marries. Exactly, exactly. So is everybody going to want to marry her, aside from her legendary beauty? Oh, yes. yes. All right. So she's, so she, yeah, she's, um, yeah, she's going to be uh, much sought after. So he wants to set her up, and he does. So to protect her, he arranges for her. Um, she ultimately marries the king of France, Louis the Seventh, Louis the Seventh. All right, so she is going to marry Louis the Seventh, and he's pretty happy about this. All right, because let's take a look at France. What is France in the 12th century? So here's here's what I want to show you. Do you see this right here? Mm -hmm. And this, the dark blue. That's France. Oh, not so much of it. Yes. That's why this is important. This is really, I have this map up here a few times today. It's important to understand this, all right? So yes, we, all of this is France, okay? But the king of France rules over this much. He's got a little bit of land surrounding Paris. And then it's broken into these duchies, do you see? Yeah. All right, and they are ruled by the dukes of these lands. See this one? Yeah. What is that one? Aquitaine. Yes, it is. Aquitaine. All right. Oh. So if all right, so if you're the king of France, yeah. now you're the king, and these are dukes. Yeah. All right. So this is I know it's kind of a little bit um, confusing. The dukes must um, they they must pay homage to the king. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because a king is a higher level. But the, the dukes are in charge of their land mass. You, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. So you are, so here's another interesting thing. Henry is the Duke of Normandy, correct? Mm -hmm. So he's the Duke of Normandy, but he's also the King of England. So he's on equal level, social level with the King of France as King of England. But what is he? Do as as the Duke of Normandy. He has an allegiance to him. He has an allegiance to the King of France. So it's a complex relationship. It's kind of a, it's a very interesting relationship. So th so this is the complicated system that is existing in the 12th century in France. <clears throat> all right, Eleanor is going to inherit all of this land. Well. She doesn't. Her husband will. Okay. So now you've got you've got uh, Louis the Seventh, and he is absolutely delighted because he's got this, and now he's got all of this that he rules. Can you see why she'd be really popular? <laughs> yes. So you know, was she really a legendary beauty, or were they just saying that to get her? You know, who knows? We don't know. We don't have a description of her. So. Please bear in mind uh, this map because it is this land, it is the land of Aquitaine that propels so much of this story. All right? Now, Eleanor, because she's been raised up essentially like a boy, 
when Louis VII wants to go on crusades, remember how the crusades were just the thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you just had to do that. It was a matter of honor and duty, and you had to do it. All right? She went with him. Yeah. Yeah, she went with him. But it kind of really broke down their marriage because um, he didn't want her there. He didn't want her there, and he was blaming her for some major losses. He was saying, you're slowing us down. You brought too much luggage. You have too many shoes with you. And um, I don't know about the shoe. I, didn't, I made that shoe part up. All right, but he did. He blamed her, and the marriage was really, really, really breaking down. They were not getting along um, very well at all. In fact, when they come back from the Crusades, which didn't go well, they went to the Pope. Um, because Louis was talking about getting an annulment, but the Pope was saying, L let's try it, let's try, you know, just um, let's try to work this out. That's not a good idea. Um, ultimately, they did not make amends. They did not rekindle anything. Um, in fact, she is quoted as having shouted at him one time, I didn't marry a man, I married a monk. So it sounds like she was disappointed. <laughs> she was disappointed, and he was disappointed. He was very disappointed because they had two daughters, and what does Louis want? He wants a son. All right, and so he finally, he went back to the Pope, and he said, um, you know, she's not, of course, it's her fault, yeah. right? Sure. It's her fault. Um, you know, I'm not, she, she can't give me sons, she can't give me sons. Um, and the Pope finally said, well, you know, you are third cousin, so I can give you an annulment based on that. So he does. He awards her, uh, he, the Pope awards Louis an annulment, okay, despite the fact that they have these uh, two children. Does that put Eleanor in danger because now she's a free woman? Yeah. It puts her in danger again, right? Yeah. So um, because this has happened, all right, she has sent a note to somebody that she, she, well, someone caught her eye about a year before. Somebody had caught her eye. He's a little younger than her by 11 years. Uh, but, yes, yeah, he's 19. He's a 19-year-old uh, man, um, and she thinks he's got a promising future. She thinks he's got a promising future. So she sends a note to this young man, and then she has to um, race through the countryside uh, to go meet up with him. Now, on her way, on her way, she's actually, uh, there are two attempts to abduct her and force and, and have her um, marry them forcefully, but she escapes. She escapes. She makes it. She Is makes it. Still about her land. Or yeah, they want her for the land. Okay. Oh but, my gosh. Yeah. So Louis didn't get the land. Does she get her land? Decree. She keeps her land. If she, so she keeps it until she remarries. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he's, he, but he doesn't think that. Okay. Because remember, they have two daughters. Mm -hmm. So Louis doesn't think that. So it's important to know. Louis does not think he's losing Aquitaine. Because he does, he he doesn't think in a million years that she's, she's gonna that she's yeah. gonna you know offend him in that way because that would be highly offensive. You know, Even though he just underestimated her, he totally he underestimated really her. He He's, big time underestimated she her. Did a job on him. Yeah, so so he thinks that when his daughters marry, he thinks it stays with him. Yeah. All right, because they do have two daughters. All right, so she does. She makes it to the young man, the 19-year-old man that she thinks has a very promising future. And who do you suppose that young man is? Henry. Henry, Henry II. Yes, yes. So she thinks that this is a great alliance. She's met him. Um, and so she's going to go ahead and marry him. And do you know... Uh, her with her legendary beauty and her great uh, land possession and Henry after everything he had already accomplished um, he's not even king yet 
but they become they become the absolute it couple all right so everybody is envious of them and they're the couple to watch so that's what so that's what's going on now we know that uh, once Stephen died Henry does become king and when Henry becomes king then his wife's property is his. automatically reverts to all right so now let's look at yeah seriously <laughs> And this is why they, they fought back and forth. It went on for centuries. Okay, so here's, all right, so see the blue? Yeah. All right, so this is Henry. This happens in four years, people. In four years. Wow. Henry inherits all of this <laughs> land, all right? So when, so Henry has England, and then he's also the, what? Normandy. Duke of Normandy. Yeah. And now he has picked up all of this as well. Okay, do you see? And where's Louis? Oh, he's crying in the chapel. For for more than just this, it gets worse for Louis, okay? You might be happy to know that not only does Henry and Eleanor a, obtain all of this um, land. They now have an empire. They have an empire. Yeah. All right. But it's not too long before they also have quite a brood. Yeah. All right. Not only do they have eight children, but how many of them are boys? Uh, not many. Throw the four. They have five. Yeah, well, five, well, William, so William is the firstborn. Yeah. Of eight children, only one of them did not live to adulthood, which is very unusual yeah. um, in the 12th century. So William, or so there's William, Henry, Richard, Jeffrey, and John, and they're going to be very familiar to you. Um, just in just a minute. William dies. He's about two years old when he dies. So now the oldest is Henry. All right, so not only does Henry get, you know, the wife of Louis, right, all of her land, but also right away, right out of the gate, she starts breeding what? Boys. Boys. So Louis feeling like, <laughs> because do you know do you know that Henry and Eleanor were married about two months after the annulment so even just that alone was a huge insult to Louis that's just such an insult uh, to him so yeah so he really was not too happy about any of uh, this he had no way he he initiated the annulment, but he had no idea that it was going to work out like this. Yeah. All right? Yeah, because now Henry gets his land that he thought was his. And it's now it's just automatically going to Henry. All right, so he did not think that out too well. All right, but let's take a look at Henry. Let's see. What is, what's Henry all about? We do have descriptions of him. What time is it? Am I? Oh, gosh. I don't know how far we're going to get today, guys. Okay, so Henry, we know he has red hair, blue eyes, he's medium height, he's very, very intelligent. He's a very intelligent guy. Um, he's a quick wit. In fact, he paid his jesters very well. All right, he liked to laugh, he liked to have entertainment. All right, he had a hot temper. All right, he had a very, very bad temper. From time to time, um, his temper would come out and he would really let loose. All right, kind of scary when he got mad. He was high energy. He was such high energy. Um, he was like uh, overly active. You know how when you hold court, mm -hmm. the king would sit in the throne? He never sat. He preferred to stand. He was t t just like a high energy kind of a, uh, kind of a guy. But he was also very compassionate. He's a very compassionate man. Um, when he heard about a famine in a location in France, um, he paid out of his own pocket uh, to send some uh, supplies, some relief to, to those people. And you can see from his policies, too, um, that he cares. He really cared about um, the common people. 
okay? He was also known for the fact that he chose his advisors well. He did not have his ego get in the way when he was choosing who would be um, advising him on certain things. Now, you know, that's pretty smart because he's just acquired an entire empire, right? He's not just the king of England. He's got a whole empire, all right? So part of his advisory board, he chooses his mother. Does that, is that sound? Yes. Yeah. I mean, is there anyone more loyal? No. No. And she's, after what she did for him, um, so he's chosen his mother, he's chosen his wife, and then he goes along with um, Henry the First, who, who created this whole new level of uh, social status, which was the new men, skilled new men, okay? And one of those low-born but highly skilled men that he chose to come on board and advise him is somebody you might recognize. Gotcha. Bob, you're so good at this. Thomas you're very good at this, yes. Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett is born um, to a, a lower class family. Um, his father might have owned a little bit of land, but it's thought that he was a petty knight. Um, so not, you know, not, um, not no normal and high born. Um, but he had a real knack for organization and finance. Okay? And so as he brought Beckett on, who was, who was recommended to him, and he took him on, um, they started doing a lot of good works together. And as they were working together, they found out that um, they were pretty good drinking buddies too. So they started hanging out together, and they became the absolute best of friends. They were the best of friends. All right? Henry completely trusted Thomas. All right, they were on the same, they were on the same page. All right, they wanted to curtail all of the, um, there was a lot of corruption. Stephen was a very weak king, and there was a lot of corruption with the barons. And so both of these men wanted to stop that, okay? And so I found, I found some coins from the time of Henry II. These are coins. That's his, so we know what he looked like. <laughs> All right, that's, that's what he looked like. Yeah, that's his, his image on a 12th century Whoa. coin. All right, now Henry and Thomas, they actually devise rules and laws for the entire empire that are known to us today in an evolved form. And those laws are what is called the common law. You're familiar with the common law? Mm -hmm. Yes, all right, common law. And so you're working land for the owner of the land. But if the owner of the land decided that, um, you know, you're, you're done, you lose your home. And so there's a protection, so Henry, put in place a protection for the common people, that they would not be um, evicted from their land. All right, so he wants control, and Thomas wants control. There was such law lawlessness under Stephen that they want to gain control and have um, a, a level law that applied to everybody throughout the empire. Now, they were getting there, they were working on that. There was one place they couldn't touch, though. Do you know what it was? Church. Yeah, church. oh, who said that? John, excellent. Yes, the church. church. You could not touch the church. If you were a clergy, you were under the church law, all right? At this time, in the 12th century, one in five men were of the clergy. And it doesn't matter what crime you commit. Doesn't matter. You could, you could commit murder. And you could be judged. And you would go through the church court, and the worst thing that could happen to you is that you pay a fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. That is it. Henry hated this. Hated this. Because there could be lawlessness, 
in the kingdom, and if it uh, was done at the hand of a clergyman, could he do anything about it? No. No. He, jurisdiction over them. he had zero jurisdiction over them. That's exactly right, Effie. He had no, um, no say, and he wanted, really desperately, he wanted to get control of that because it just wasn't uh, fair, and it wasn't working for him. Well, he had this golden opportunity when the archbishop passed away. He wanted to name somebody archbishop. He, he has that authority to name who is the archbishop. And so he had such a good idea. Yeah. And the idea was to name Thomas Beckett, who was, who was his chancellor um, at the time. So Thomas is working for him as chancellor. And Henry thinks, I'm going to name my best buddy in all the world. The guy who, is, who gets me 100% finishes my sentences. That's the guy I want, OK? I'm going to put him. Now, do you know that his other advisors had something to say about that? Don't do it. <laughs> Matilda was saying, don't do it. <laughs> Eleanor was saying, don't do it. All right, they, they, they saw the folly in this decision. But perhaps the one time Henry didn't listen to them uh, was was a fatal mistake. It was a, literally a fatal mistake. All right, so he does. He goes and he names Thomas Beckett Archbishop. All right, now instantly, what does Beckett do? Well, he, um, he resigns from being chancellor because if you're chancellor, who's your boss? The king. The king. If you're archbishop, who's your boss? The Pope. Oh, Pope. Pope. God. God. Oh, God. I forgot God. God. So if you have the opportunity to not be under the king, are you going to take that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So really, if you're, if you're boss, if you're the archbishop, okay, and your boss is God, um, and then you're just going to you know, pray and make decisions uh, together with God, that's probably going to go more in your favor, correct? Yes. So that's what, so he, so he can't, so he resigns and he's just going to be uh, the archbishop and he has all of a sudden, even though he was the great drinking buddy of the king, all right, and found he has found religion. That's exactly right. He has found religion. And so he's going to be taking it very, very seriously. And when Henry wants to make changes to be able to have jurisdiction within the church, mm -hmm. what does Thomas do? Blocks, Blocks. yeah, yeah, he's going to block him. All right, now this goes on for some years. This goes back and forth, all right? Henry wants to do something. Thomas might agree at first, but then change his mind. All right, so he's really kind of... <laughs> You know, just jerking him around a lot. Yes. All right. So this is causing incredible tension between the two men. It's absolutely infuriating. Now, Henry decides, Henry decides that what he wants to do to assure, you know, because if you wait till you, you die before you name your heir, does that throw everything um, into havoc? Because anything could happen, right? right. So he's thinking to himself, I'm going to name my son king, but he'll be king in waiting. I'm still king yeah. until I die, but I'm naming him king in waiting. He's the first one that this has ever, this has never happened since. Wow. All right, this is the only time that this has happened. So we have the, now uh, with William, the past as a toddler, young Henry is crowned king in waiting. So this is young, he's called young King Henry. All right? But because of all the turmoil between Henry and Beckett, Henry doesn't want Beckett, who would normally be officiating at this service as archbishop, he doesn't want him there. All right? He wants to bypass him altogether. And so he has somebody else crown his son king in waiting king king in waiting all right when thomas beckett finds out about this he is irate 
because it's his duty. It's his responsibility. It's a huge snub that he wasn't there. And he's so mad about this that all of the clergy that attended the coronation of young King Henry, king in waiting, guess what Beckett did? <laughs> yes. He threw him out of the church. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> excommunicated. I know, you were, well, you know what? Because what does it mean to be excommunicated? What do they believe? Don't go to an outsider. It's not a frivolous thing. No. All right? It's a very, very, very serious thing. All right, so he excommunicates them. And now we have Henry, who is furious that Beckett has done this. These two men are just butting heads, and then there's a lot of people that, that get in the way of that, right? Mm. So he is in one of his uh, tirades. You know how he has a really bad temper? Um, he's in one of his tirades, and he's spouting off about, how long am I going to have to put up with this guy? I raised him up out of you know, low-born status, and I made him everything, and he goes on and on and on. And so his guards, hearing this, think that they're receiving an order. <laughs> <laughs> they think that they're receiving an order to go get this guy. And so some of his guards go to Canterbury Cathedral, and they go to arrest Beckett. But he's resisting arrest. In fact, he goes deeper into the cathedral and he goes to the altar and he's like holding on to the altar. And there's other priests around that are witnessing this. And as he's resisting arrest, the soldiers are struggling with him. And one of them takes his sword, and I'll spare you the gory details, but slices off the top of his head. I know that's kind of gory, but it's even gorier. Okay. All right. It's yes. It's described. It's described gory. So it was absolutely a horrific scene, uh, shocking and grotesque. And the fact that it happened at, at an altar, yes, in the cathedral, was just this. This was just mind blowing. All right. There were many witnesses to it. All right. So now he has been. Uh, viciously murdered right there in the church by the altar. He's holding to it. I mean, this just can't get any worse. It cannot get any worse, all right? So what does the church do? They're instantly going to make him a saint, right? All right, normally it takes a while to become a saint, but not with uh, Beckett. He's instantly, he becomes instantly, instantly, um, he becomes a saint. Now, let me see what time it is. It's 4 o'clock right now. How much more? All right. Oh, I've got way, 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 way more. Oh. All right. Yeah. We're going to go into Ireland and stuff. Oh. There's a, yeah, yeah. So why don't I end it right now? Okay. All right. I just felt like we really needed that review, that lengthy review, but we won't have to do that much next week. All right, but why don't we stop right now because this, is, this goes into a whole other um, part of the story. All right, so just, you know, we'll do a quick review next time and we'll pick it up from there. What do you say? Okay. All right, all right, very good. Okay, thank you for coming and I will see you next time.